Uh, today happens to be the feast of um, someone who's not a saint yet, but her name is uh, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. And uh, she's rather famous, actually. And she, her writings were used uh, almost extensively for that movie, um, The Passion. You know, uh, she had revelations and so forth, and, and so uh, they drew from her writings. But one of the wonderful things that she wrote is that she said that uh, towards the end of the ages, uh, the, the incorrupt body of St. Joseph will be found. And, um, and then there's another Saint uh, Paul of Mill, and St. Paul of Mill, who was a Benedictine uh, monk, also very um, miraculous, lots of experiences with the devil, and gave us a lot of the church, a lot of background on how to deal with uh, dark spirits. Uh, but one of the things that he wrote was that he was given to know that um, there would be a saint who would speak and know um, of the, uh, the place of St. Joseph's uh, body. And that, he was in the 1300s, uh, and Catherine was in the 1800s. And she's the only one ever that has alluded to it. But she said, it will be found, and he had said in his earlier uh, prophecy, it will be found when great attention will be given to St. Joseph by the church. Yeah. And I think we've seen that happening. There's been that building up all of a sudden in the church about the, the place of St. Joseph, so you never know. But the truth of it is, is that his body is somewhere. It's never been found. And actually, um, we have in Rome, Rome is called the mother of, of the relics, and the Orthodox churches always go to Rome when they need or desire to have relics of the apostles or the early saints. We house them, we have them. And uh, one that we just don't have is St. Joseph. No one has ever discovered where his body uh, was uh, buried. Obviously, we don't have St. Michael, right? <laughs> we don't have feathers or anything like that. <laughs> And, uh, uh, of course, we don't have the Blessed Mother. That would be impossible. Um, but, and we don't have uh, really anything of our Lord, except maybe if you consider the Shroud of Turin. There are also um, other things, like when Notre Dame was burning down in France, they rushed in to get what was the prize of the entire, the prize relic, uh, there are actually two of Notre Dame Cathedral. One was the Crown of Thorns, and the other was um, the Veil of the Virgin Mary. And actually, the Cathedral of Notre Dame was built because of the Veil. The French people had received the Veil from Rome, from the Pope. And when they received it, they built this as a huge reliquary. So, you know, you have usually a little reliquary that holds a, um, a small relic of a saint. Actually, Notre Dame is like a huge reliquary. It was meant to house the veil of the Virgin Mary. Another little aside, if you go into a cathedral and you look up, you will most of the time see that it's shaped very oddly. It's shaped like a, the underside of a boat, the ceiling. And that's because every cathedral is supposed to be an ark, Noah's Ark, and uh, bringing in as many of the people from danger, from the flood, and so forth. So there's wonderful things about cathedrals and why they're built and how they're built. Um, but tonight we're, we're moving into um, a direction which is very, very important and very beautiful and very scary to a lot of people, including Catholics, I think, and a, uh, some Catholics are very put off by it. And there are some very, very good Catholics who um, attend Mass and Rosary and Adoration, but do not go to confession because they just feel uncomfortable about it. And I'm hoping that if you know somebody like that, you can begin to gently talk to them about it because it really is beautiful. 
And there's a lot of good reasons why we should make uh, use of this great gift. So we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we praise you. We bless you this night. We ask your blessing fall upon us this evening as we gather together, your people. Uh, we love you. We know that you love us. Help us, Lord, to uh, let go of the things that keep us from you. And help us uh, in that forgiveness that only you can give, that we might find uh, in you the grace and the love uh, in order to move forward in our lives free and finally to choose and come to the kingdom where you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. 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 The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is all about freedom, by the way. Freedom comes up uh, a lot. It has come up in our past um, uh, gatherings. And uh, the Eucharist frees us. But in a very particular way, the sacrament of penance frees us. So penance, or the sacrament of confession, or the sacrament of reconciliation, it's all the same. The official name of, the seven, uh, the, of this sacrament of the seven is the sacrament of penance, okay? And so you have this picture here, and um, it's uh, uh, rather, I think, beautiful, uh, simple. This is the way confession would have been given for many, many centuries before we um, uh, went to the confessional box. And uh, the reason why the church went to the confessional box, actually, was um, almost a kind of a, a greater sense of, of compassion and charity, because she figured that there were some people who uh, uh, were very intimidated by going to the priest face to face. Now, that might happen, especially if you're in a little village out in nowhere, and there's no other Catholic church for miles and miles, and no other priest except Father is there. And so Father is the keeper of the secrets, that's for sure. But still, you might feel a little nervous about talking to him about something you're going to see him for the rest of your life in that little village. But remember, there is something called the seal of the confessional. And that's not an animal, but that is <laughs> the seal, which means that uh, whatever is spoken of in the confessional um, cannot be uh, spoken of outside of the confessional. By the way, there is something that you folks forget a lot, which is you are held under the seal of the confessional too. You're not supposed to talk about your confessions either. So it is to protect the sacredness of the moment of, and of the sacrament. If you're in line and you hear, you know, people confessing, I notice in our church, a lot of times people back up, you know, in the line there, because if you're too close, you can kind of hear. And again, when you do that, that's good, because you're protecting the seal of the confessional when you do that. And you don't want to hear what's being said. You don't want to know anything um, about the person in front of you. And you don't want anybody in back of you to, you know, know what you're saying either. So it's a, a great uh, sense of respect when that happens. But the, um, the sacrament is certainly meant to take away serious sin. What do we call that? That mortal, sin. Mortal, mortal sin. Good. Mortal sin. Very good. And mortal sin is also called death-dealing sin. Okay? So it's dangerous. Red flag. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. Remember that? If you're a... You probably don't remember that. <laughs> Lost in Space. Do you remember that? Okay, some of us do. That was a show that used to be on TV. Anyway, danger, danger. And that's what the, the mortal sin is. It's, um, uh, we're in a crisis. We're in trouble. Okay? And the other sin that is not mortal is called? Very good. Being your sin. It is not death dealing. But what it does is it's sort of the way I look at it, it's like a mosquito. It's annoying. And it's not enough to get, you know, to put you in the grave. But what it is, is that it annoys you. It's scratchy. You know, you can't quite get rid of it. And um, uh, 
and it keeps coming back. No matter, you know, at night, you're, you can hear it, right? Yeah. And then you, you're looking to find, where are you? And you turn the light on, and then it's quiet. It won't show itself. And it's a, a back and forth in this game of trying to find out where is that uh, mosquito. And you know, the venial sin, in some ways, is the same way. Remember that venial sin and mortal sin always have something underneath. So, for instance, if, um, if someone has uh, trouble with gossip um, or uh, anger, there's always something underneath. It's very important to, yes, attack what is obvious. I got angry. I keep getting angry. But then it's very important to go underneath that to figure out why am I getting angry? Where does that come from? Have I always been like this? Is it because I'm under a lot of stress? Or is this something that I can remember I had a short fuse ever since I was a kid? See, uh, what we're going to talk about in a little bit that happens is that uh, the sacrament of confession makes you self-aware. Makes you self-aware. And this isn't you so much as it is the Holy Spirit who is unveiling more and more what is imperfect and what is at fault and what is um, perhaps an area that if we don't attend to it could become dangerous. And the reason why we do deal with venial sins is because they can grow and develop. They can become dangerous sins if we don't, if we're not careful. And you'll find that once you, you begin to really uh, deal with something that's very serious, all of a sudden there's something else that raises its head. You begin to deal with that, all of a sudden there's something else that comes up. And, and this is part of the spiritual life. This isn't uh, something to get exasperated about. But this is the way God works with us, is that he's healing us little by little. And I often tell folks that you know, sometimes there's a sin that happened a long time ago, and all of a sudden, maybe years later, it becomes very important. It's gnawing at me. I don't know what to do with this. I've got to bring it to confession. That's the Holy Spirit moving you along. And the Holy Spirit who is saying, it's time. It happened a long time ago, for sure. But now it's time to bring it to get healed. You can do this now. You can find the courage now to, to talk about it. And the strength of darkness, or we can even call it the, the demonic, is that it insists on things being hidden. It wants things to be hidden. It wants things to be forgotten. It wants things to, um, to sleep, and at the same time to cause anxiety. Okay? And I believe truly a lot of people who are very, very anxious and very, very unhappy, and I'm just talking now about Catholics, but a lot of people who are very unhappy, they haven't been to confession in a long time, and it would do them a world of good. Because remember that the sacrament of confession is more powerful than exorcism. And exorcism is pretty powerful. St. John Bosco, I believe, is the one who said, Remember, priest, every time you confess, you are robbing the devil. You are stealing from the devil. The only time that you are permitted to steal. Right? So you're taking back but a soul and giving the soul back to God. See, that's what confession does. And this is why the devil hates it so much. Because it is a frontal attack on him. And this is why of the seven sacraments, this is the most misunderstood one, and the um, one that causes most nervousness. Now, to some extent, we can understand that, because there you are, you know, you're, you're in line and you're waiting, and um, we're moving along, and I, I can remember this kind of feeling, butterflies inside, and, you know, I don't want to forget what I need to say, and now going back again, did I remember everything though? 
And then, oh, for heaven's sake, Lord, please, I don't want to forget my prayer, active contrition prayer. That would be the worst, you know. And, um, and so what happens is that already, even in the line for confession, we're getting nervous. But this isn't bad, I don't think. This is a part of being human. There's not something wrong with you because you're feeling that. Remember, uh, this is humility. And so when you're approaching the sacrament, uh, you are fighting against your own pride and independence. And you are remembering that there is one greater than you. There is one that even kings have to bow before. Isn't it interesting, in the funeral rites for a king, for the Catholic Mass, once the, the, the Mass begins, he is never referred to as His Majesty or anything like that. He's referred to by his first name because being king no longer matters anymore. He is now like all of us. So when we leave this world, we are all equal, you know, before God, even kings, right? Now, the, later on, it's the Irish monks who will introduce the confessional box. We have the, the grail. And it used to be that we didn't go face to face. That's actually something that appeared after the Second Vatican Council. Um, it's a good thing, but it's really, um, it plays havoc with a church like St. Anne's because we have such a small little space for a, a confessional. It's hard to really um, uh, change it so that you have access to face to face, which is comfortable, and also that you can kneel. As you get older, um, I think like me, my knees, uh, it's a little bit harder to kneel down. Well, it's easier to kneel and it's harder to get up. <laughs> and uh, for that reason too, the chair is a good thing. It's good to have a chair there. And I think it was Father Dewey who put in the confessional here, um, the prodigal son. And he made that the, the, uh, the real um, center of what's happening in that moment. And it's, it's really a beautiful, not many churches ever thought that way to do that. Usually it's a crucifix or, or Christ with a sinner or something like that. But the prodigal son about uh, the young man who goes and, and, and goes crazy in the world and uh, is really having a, you know, a great time of it. And then things fall apart. Uh, not so much because he wasn't take, taking care of his, his uh, crazy life, but because there's a famine and all these other things that hit, and eventually they um, destroy his position and place in that society where he's at. And to remember that he has to go to um, work on a farm and take care of pigs. Now, when Christ is telling this story, it's very important when a Jew is hearing it, it's a Jew would say, oh, my God, mm -hmm. working with pigs. Oh. Because remember, the pig is the worst animal in the world. You, you shall not eat pork. You know, Jews, Orthodox Jews, don't eat pork. Um, too dangerous, right? And um, so it is Christ, though, in the New Testament, who then says, um, All things are clean, all animals are clean. And so from the New Testament time, the church then does not follow that mosaic. Uh, prescription that you should not eat pork. But Christ, when he is speaking to the, the folks, the people, he says he's taking care of, you know, pigs. And, um, and then the young man says, well, my goodness, I should just go home and work in my father's, you know, business there and take care of his pigs. At least I'll get better food. And, uh, and all the way home, he's rehearsing. This is what we do, right? We rehearse in our minds. What am I going to say to Father? What am I going to say to Father? And all the way home, he's rehearsing about, okay, I've got to say, Father, I love you. Father, I've sinned against you. Um, I don't deserve your forgiveness, your mercy, but please. And he has this all finally in his head. And the beautiful things, the Father sees him from far away, and the Father begins to run to him. Now, this is significant, too. So the Father has been wronged, and in all rights, he should wait. In all rights and justice, he should wait for that wayward son to come, kneel down, and beg for his mercy and forgiveness. 
and it would be understood by everyone. But it's not what this father does. This father doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about power. He doesn't care about dominance. He doesn't care about um, some revenge in some sense. Instead, he himself runs to his son, and be, the son begins to say father and goes to his formula before he can even get to really the, the best part of it and finish. Um, the, the father is already embracing him. And then he says, um, you know, kill the fatted calf, bring a ring and put it on his finger, and so forth, and we're going to celebrate. And um, Christ himself used this as a very powerful message of, you don't understand the Father. That's what he was, he's constantly telling the people this. You don't understand the Father. You don't know the Father. The Father loves you. And the mercy of the Father is so amazing. And you keep putting him into a box. And you keep demanding things of him that he does not want. An eye for an eye, right? The woman caught in adultery, you shall stone her. The Virgin Mary, who is almost stoned, that's what should have happened to her. Except that St. Joseph decided to divorce her quietly, to save her life at least. Their union was going to be over, but he just could not bring himself to have Mary uh, brought before others and then and murdered like that, killed. And then the full message is finally given to Joseph. Thank God. Um, so the, the prodigal son is, is a constant reminder in the confessional that as you were standing outside in line, going over your sins and what you're going to say and how you're going to say it and how many times that happened with, and I'm so embarrassed to even say it out loud. I'm embarrassed to say it to Father um, already God the Father is embracing you. And already you should be feeling his love and his peace, actually, as you're getting closer and closer to the door. And then you go in, in my experience, over 33 years at least, I've never yelled at anybody in confession. I don't know any priest. I don't know any priest that ever has done that either. Um, sometimes we go too fast. And that's because... There is um, this. There are two ways that we approach the sacrament, priest. The first way is that you just bring your sins. You don't need to give me the story. It doesn't have to be a Netflix saga. <laughs> <laughs> you just say, "Father, I've been lying too much." Okay, and you don't honestly. You don't have to. Be, when I was a kid, we had to actually say the number of times. Okay, I think that just causes more anxiety. <laughs> so I think really what the church is asking is, is it rare? Is it frequent, frequent, or is it out of control? Am I lying or gossiping? Uh, it happened. I just feel terrible about it because I never gossiped, Father. But this was bad, and I don't know what happened, but this is what happened. Or... Every once in a while this happens, Father, and it's, you know, I'm concerned about it. Or, this is like all the time, and I'm in danger now because I don't know what to do about it because that's all I do is talk about people, you know, behind their backs. So you can see that the penance, the help that the priest is going to give, will depend on you telling me how frequent it has been, okay? It's the same way with, well, how long has it been since your last confession? You don't have to start thinking, you know, through the month and the last month, and, you know, was it six weeks or was it six and a half weeks? Or, again, too much anxiety with that. Just say, if you remember, and maybe you do, it's been a month or it's been two months or it's been a week, something like that, um, or it's been a while. And I'll use to say, a long while or a little while, <laughs> you know? Because we use words, we're, even in the confessional, we're very careful about how we, we say things. 
And, uh, but it's, it's important again because if it's been a long while, again, I'm going to treat this a little bit differently than if it was just three days ago. In fact, I'll tell you, if someone comes to me and says in confession, it's been three days, two days since my last confession, I will invariably say something is wrong because the confession, the sacrament is so powerful Somehow you're not working with it. There's a door that's closing off grace because it should not, you should not be falling that easy. There's too much love of God that's being thrown to you, and yet somehow you walked out of the confessional as if you hadn't gone. You know, that's another problem. Okay, we need to talk about that. So um, again, there are some priests who ascribe to just tell me the sin. Don't tell me the story. Definitely don't tell me what your husband is doing or your wife is doing. <laughs> and that happens. Or your son or your daughter. And you know, if they were here, that'd be great. Um, or um, there is another uh, group of priests, you know, and, and the way they look at it is almost like spiritual direction. So you need to tell me something, and I will tell you something. I will give you um, guidance, not just... Uh, say, three Hail Marys. Um, I'm kind of in the middle. And I'll move you along if I think we're, we're just kind of treading water here, going in circles. Um, but I really believe that it's important for you to tell me as accurately as you can what's going on, and then I'm going to try and help you with, you know, keeping in mind that there are other people waiting and so forth. But... Um, as little time as I can, but I'm going to try and be succinct about how to help you with this. So not just to take it away, but to give you a lifeline too. Okay. Now, sometimes someone will come into confession and they're going to confess something really uh, uh, difficult. Um, it could be a teenager that, uh, and this happens a lot, I uh, Sad to say, um, in general, I think a lot of teens deal with a lot of pressure and stress. And because of that, they think about suicide. They think about, they cut themselves, all those kind of things. Whenever a teen says to me, um, I've been thinking about suicide, or maybe anybody, it's going to take just a little bit longer because I can't let that go. And so um, I will redirect and come back to that why, what's going on. And then they begin to open up about what's really happening, what really is deep, deep on, on their hearts. I think it makes for a good confession. At the same time, you have to be patient in line. If it takes a little bit longer, it's not because Father, you know, wants to hear about somebody's vacation or something and find out where the best, uh, you know, cabin is or something. <laughs> But it's because something serious is happening. And I, I would bet that's for most priests. And, um, and I'm sorry if we're not able to get to everybody by the end of it, but this one, you couldn't just say, say three Hail Marys. That would have been terrible. Okay, It wouldn't have helped them. Now, uh, if you've gone to me, uh, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> Most of the time, I will give five Hail Marys and, and one Our Father. Um, but it's very deceptive because I, I give a lot of, I talk a lot real fast. And I get a lot in there about what you can do, you should do, and so forth. And, um, and then I tack on the five Hail Marys and the one Our Father. So you're getting, actually, you're getting more. Um, but I really believe that this is good because we need, I, I think we need to advise and guide. And at the same time, I want to pull you back to something very um, fundamental and basic and beautiful, which is just the Hail Mary and the Our Father. Five Hail Marys in my mind in, in honor of the five holy wounds of Christ. And then the, the Our Father in honor of the most holy trinity. That's the way in my head I, I see it. So that you're connecting with the Virgin and you're connecting with um, the Holy Trinity, my intent, right? And, and there's something very beautiful about the Hail Mary and the Our Father, glory be and so forth. Um, how many times, you know, I've gone to uh, convalescent homes 
and I'm doing the anointing and I'm doing all the prayers and the person is rather not aware. And then all of a sudden I start praying the Hail Mary and immediately they begin praying the Hail Mary out loud with me. And then the Our Father, immediately the Our Father. Somehow it still is ingrained in us and it's a beautiful thing. It should be that way, right? That's, um, if we can, my Lord, if that's the last thing before we leave this world that we're saying, the Hail Mary, the Our Father, beautiful. What a way to transition from this world to the next world, right? With the, the words of God on our lips. Okay, so um, happily here at St. Anne's, if we have um, too many people in line and we're not able to finish before Mass, um, all of us priests always say, you know, once Mass is ended, I'll come back and hear your confession. And so that happens pretty well. And then remember, too, that it's not just the confession times that are available for you, but actually um, you can call and make an appointment. And if you have something that is really um, important and weighty, you should probably do confession that way and not in the confessional line where you're not going to have the amount of time that you need to really talk about what's going on and maybe get something off your chest. But if you make an appointment, you have a half hour or more in order to do that. And um, that's very, very, very good. Now, obviously, it's not going to be behind the grill or the screen. You know, I already know you. you there you are. Um, I made the appointment with you, so you can wear a hat and glasses and everything. It's not going to make a difference. I remember, I think I may have shared this with you when I, I was in my uh, first assignment. And uh, we were, it was during uh, Lent and we're hearing confessions. Uh, we, have, uh, we didn't have really penance services, but we had uh, extra confession times, uh, which was beautiful too. And then I got asked to help out at another church. So I went to that other church, and I'm sitting in the confessional, and the door opens, and the person comes in, and then says, <gasps> like that, and looks at me, and I look at him, and I said, why are you here? Why aren't you back at our church? And, and he says, uh, he says, I guess I might as well sit down. Says, no use to be going to behind the screen now. You know? <laughs> So, um, you know, and there's got to be some beauty in it all, too, right? Uh, and I, there's many times, too, where someone will be giving their, their confession, and they'll say something funny, and they know they said something funny, and I'll laugh, because it's funny, and then they laugh, and, and you know, but it, it's endearing, and it's part of the beauty of the sacrament, right? So, um, it's human. And if we go back finally to the very beginnings, well, this is, of course, the way it happened with our Lord. Um, uh, less institutional because of the box and so forth. And more really a human interaction. Now, of course, it happens even with the grill. There's a human interaction. It's good and it's beautiful. And it's up to you how you want to approach that sacrament. And we're okay with that. It's like communion on the tongue or in the hand. It's up to you, you know. And, uh, but the important piece here is don't make the decision out of fear. Make the decision out of what best brings you into relationship with the Lord. What best helps you to experience him? Okay. I used to go for many, many years, even as a seminarian, uh, behind the grill. And then one day, um, again, I walked in the confessional, and there's Father, and I said, where's the grill? Oh, we don't have the grill. We're working on the confessional. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I sat down and made my confession, and, I, and afterwards I remember walking out thinking, why? Well, I, I like this. I don't think I'm going to go back to the grill anymore. I like this. And, and so now, oh, my goodness, you know, sometimes... Uh, uh, a father is visiting, we're maybe taking a walk on the pier, and maybe he says, or I'll say, would you hear my confession? Sure, of course. And there we are, and there's nobody around, and we're just on beautiful on the pier there with the water, and you make a confession, you know, face to face, just like that. I didn't have my stole. That's not absolutely necessary, okay? 
The stoltz should be there. It's wonderful when it can be in the confessional, um, but that doesn't keep us from doing confession. By the way, uh, and next week we'll talk about it, there's going to be changes to um, the formula for confession. The uh, Holy Father has approved it, Vatican has approved it, and that's going to start on Ash Wednesday. And we are allowed time because we're creatures of you know, habit, so we have to get to the new formula in our heads. Uh, and I think it's by Divine Mercy Sunday that we have to uh, finally use the new formula and not go back to the old formula. But we'll talk about that more uh, next week. That's just to whet your appetite. Okay, the foundations. Always important to begin with the Word of God. In the Catechism, it reminds us, 1440, sin before all else is an offense against God, a rupture of communion with Him. So especially mortal sin is a huge rupture of friendship with God. Remember that sin is attacking goodness all the time. Sin is dark. Sin is evil. It's attacking all the, the beautiful innocence and purity of what God is about. And you happen to be, all of you, are battlefields. Because we are a mix unfortunately, in this world, of sin and grace. But when mortal sin happens, it excludes grace completely. It breaks the friendship. And we have to um, confess in order to be reconciled again. At the same time, it damages communion with the church. And for this reason, conversion entails both God's forgiveness and reconciliation with the church, which are expressed and accomplished liturgically, by the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. So it's not a private affair. So in the same way that when we sin, we sin against God, it also um, damages the relationship with the church founded by Christ. And when we build up the church, we build up our relationship with God. So it works both ways. But everything that Christ did, it's interesting, isn't it, is communal. So um, even the Mass, the celebration of the Eucharist was at a supper, the Last Supper. Um, all our sacraments, when you get married, do you know in the beginning, centuries ago, you would come to the front doors of the church, which were still closed, you would say your vows there, outside of the church, and then the doors would open and you would go in and then Mass would be celebrated. And then over the centuries, the church said, no, let's bring the vows into Holy Mass. So now, uh, First Communion, Confirmation, Marriage, everything is uh, hopefully um, contained and, and blessed by the Eucharist, you know, by the Mass. Now, we do have some situations, like a marriage, let's say that um, a lot of times I've had uh, maybe a Catholic who married someone who was Jewish. And it could be that the Jewish family was very hesitant about um, uh, having the ceremony in the church. Now, most of the time, uh, and you can understand this, we would not celebrate the Mass because there would be one person and a whole section of the family would have no connection at all with what we were doing, right? And it would even be a sign of division almost <laughs> for something that's supposed to be a sign of unity, marriage. So this is why we always encourage um, uh, the vows outside of Mass for that situation. Actually out of... Uh, compassion and empathy and so forth, not, not because we want to punish the Catholic party or, you know, anything like that. Um, and so a lot of times, there was one time where I did the ceremony in a uh, deli, because that's all the, the Jewish family would accept. And I had to get permission from the bishop, and I did. And we did the vows there in the deli, and then we went over and had roast beef right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it was really handy. Um, 
by and this is the the extent even to that the church will go see she wants it in church she wants it surrounded by the eucharist and so forth but um, you fell in love with a jew and she loves you or he loves you and we will reverence that you know and we will not force that person to become catholic we would love them to become catholic but we will not force them to become catholic but we will marry him. Yeah. My family is still Jewish. And I have to laugh because I sit here for two every week for 28 years. And some of the Catholics that know he's Jewish will say you're more Catholic than most Catholics. <laughs> 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 and and he, he raised your children Catholic and taught to say a few of them are practicing Catholics because he showed up at church every week. See, look at that. That's oh, wonderful. You see him sitting next to me and he's not kneeling. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's why. That's why. It's wonderful. My my uncle uh, was a, a holy roller. My uncle was a that's what we used to call them. Uh, even kind of assemblies of God, Protestant, evangelical, and he was my godfather. And he married my aunt, who was very very Catholic, and um, they had a beautiful marriage. And he sent all the kids through um, modern day, you know, high school, paid for it, and they're all very strong Catholics too. And they never knew, but after I became a priest, he would come to Mass and I would see him. And he would come and he would sit in the very last row, right at the end, and he would just sit. And then uh, when it was time for communion, he disappeared. But he never told the family that he would do this. You know, and after he died, then I, you know, I shared that with everybody. But yeah, there, you know, we had bless a, them. Yeah, we had a rabbi and a priest, and we had a lot of Christ. There you go. We, we had to serve. It's funny because the priest made us go through all the, the marital classes yes. and, the, and the rabbi did too, so we were extra grounded. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and I'll tell you with the, I mean, when that extra comes from uh, the Jewish community or the rabbi or from the Protestant minister, I think it's a plus. I, I think it's great. The more and more that we hear from two different worlds, basically the same thing about fidelity and faithfulness and love and so forth. I mean, that's great. It's good. So um, the Holy Sacrament is gifted to us after the resurrection when our Lord appears to the apostles, still hidden for fear of the Jews. That's the way that, remember, the, the apostles are not sure what's going on. And the at this time, the emotions are running high where Christ has been crucified. And the apostles are thinking, are we next? Are we going to be rounded up? And actually, after, right after resurrection and ascension into heaven, there is a period of time where there is a Jewish persecution of, Christ, of Catholics or Christians. And that's where we get the martyrdom of um, uh, St. Stephen, you know, and many others. And eventually by, uh, I think it's the fourth century, that's when Constantine, makes the empire Christian, and all these great homes that are basilicas, not churches, that's what they called them back then, basilicas, they all of a sudden become churches. They, people leave in their, their you know, last will and testament and so forth, should be used by the church. And um, so like St. Mary's Major, uh, all these, St. Paul outside the walls, all these great basilicas were, um, you know, domestic buildings at one time. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, this is how history is. Then you find um, that the uh, Christian nations will then persecute the Jews. And um, it's, it's complicated and, and sad. And it's not until... Mm, Certainly John the 23rd, but really John Paul II is the one that, that really makes tremendous breakthroughs with the Jewish community. And he does that in Rome by one day going to um, a synagogue. And believe it or not, a pope had not walked into a synagogue from back then until John Paul. And probably a lot of Catholics hadn't either. And it changed finally. And when I did my work in DC, um, oftentimes I mean, the Jewish Catholic uh, relationship and dialogue is very strong and very warm and very good. 
And uh, even the Holy Father was just um, talking about three days ago about the great concern of the church that there's a rise in anti-Semitism and that the church in all her different countries has to confront this. So ever since John Paul, um, the popes, all of the popes have been very, very good about um, alerting the world that anti-Semitism is a great sin and is not to be um, at all uh, considered as well it's you know part of our culture or part of our history no 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 in, in the same way that um, lately under Francis actually the mafia has been taking a big hit did you know in, Sic in Sicily you cannot have godparents anymore at a baptism well. yeah the bishops have declared in Sicily no more godparents not for now and that's because the mafia has been using godparents as uh, infiltrating into families. And so the, the church took that decision that for now, no godparents. Uh, hmm. So, and we've had, of course, um, people that have been killed because of that in Nigeria. Now, this, this year, one year, 33 priests have been murdered because they've spoken out against the government in Mexico. Uh, many priests have been murdered because they spoke out against the drug cartel, cartels that are pretty much running the country now. And um, but you have to you have to say something. And it may be that we're getting to a time of persecution too. It, it just seems like we we kind of move more and more and more towards this strange place that we've never been in as a nation. Um, we got to see what's going to happen. Okay, so you remember the Lord says, Peace be with you. Who sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Who sins you retain, they are retained. So this is tremendous. Just think about it for a moment. You know, because remember when Christ will do miracles, the, the argument will be, well, who can forgive sins? And then Christ says, so that you may believe, pick up your mat and go, your sins are forgiven, you know? And so the man is healed, and that's the proof of Christ by saying, I can forgive sins, I forgive sins. Now, Christ gives it to his apostles, which is astounding. Only God can forgive sins. And now, Christ gives this to the 12. So, whose sins you shall retain are retained. And so we talk about the keys of heaven, and how what is said by the church on earth, the church in heaven honors when it comes to something of sacraments. And uh, there's only been, I think, maybe two times I was talking to a father about this uh, yesterday. Yeah, I, there's only two times that I've ever not granted confession. But basically it was because the person told me they weren't intending at all to change. It's a strange thing. Why would you go to confession and then tell the priest that I'm not going to change? But it happened. And so, um, you know, I, and I said, you got to give something. You got to open the door a little bit, just a little. No. I said, then I can't. I can't forgive you. No. Um, it's not magic, you know. And uh, on the other hand, there was uh, somebody a long time ago that uh, was a really big proponent of uh, abortion and told me, Father, I'm a good Catholic. I do everything at this, you know, that, but I believe in abortion. I fight for abortion and so forth. I said, no, that I, I can't confess you. But if you open the door just a little bit, and I said, are you willing to tell me in the sacrament that that you are open to God changing you if you are wrong. That there's a possibility you're not 100%. And the person said, yes. I said, okay, I will confess you now. And then we kept going and going and going through the year, and two years, and that person became a pro-life Catholic. Very, very strong pro-life out there trying to make a difference and so forth. 
But what would have happened if I said, I will not hear your confession? You know, I had to find that little place where there was an opening. Thank God, you know? Yeah. It's, it's um, for people that voted for the abortion. Well, uh, we can get into that maybe next time with questions. There's, I'm not putting it off that, that it's a true complication. And even a president who says he's Catholic and yet is pushing radically this whole you know direction of abortion. And I'll be the first to tell you that's not right. And that's um, a false representation of our faith. And it bothers me because what's happening is a lot of people who aren't maybe religious or not connected to the Catholic faith are thinking that it's okay. The president is Catholic and he's pushing for it. And, you know, so it's... It causes tremendous confusion. Uh, finally, we get a Catholic president, you know, the second one. Thank you. Finally, a Catholic president. And, you know, we're worse off than, than before. So uh, it's, it's really a shame. It's really a shame. And I think I told some of you when I had the Orthodox priest meet here, the Orthodox priest of... Um, uh, Orange County, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, uh, Syrian Orthodox, um, Coptic Orthodox, um, all these different fathers. And we had dinner here at St. Anne's here in this room. And then uh, we try to do this, you know, every month or two months. And then we just talk. We're, we're good friends over the years. And they said, Father, you know, we're good friends. And we're honest with each other about what happens and things like that. And I said, yeah. And they said, you know, we're embarrassed that a member of the Catholic Church is leading our country and is so pro-abortion. We're embarrassed. And I said, well, yeah. They wore, the, this is, they wore pins last night at the State of the Union that said, I love abortion. I yeah. Abortion. See, I, I love abortion. What's happened is it becomes a political thing now yeah. instead yeah. of a, a human thing that needs to be Confronted, it's become a political thing, in the, and it determines now what is Republican and what is Democrat, and and that's not the way. You know, when I was growing up, it was always an issue where the government said, "This is something that the churches and and groups you need to work this out and you know and figure it out." But that's not the place of of politics. But now that has become very very different, yeah. and. Um, you know, when a, when a child is born, when it's born, and it could be left on a table to die, there's, that's infanticide. You know, that, that's what the Catholic Church fought against when the empire um, became Christian. That was our first battle. First battle was, why are all those little girls, those baby girls, being left on dumps to die? That's what they did in the Roman times. They thought it was civilized. A child would get cold, fall asleep, and die. If it was a boy, that was different. And the Catholic Church successfully brought that to an end. That was her first battle with the empire. And the second battle was with um, pacifism. She refused to um, fight, uh, to enter into the armies that were extending and taking over throughout the empire, and she refused to do it. And so eventually that broke down also uh, the empire. Anyway, interesting, huh? History. Okay. The sacrament is ecclesial. That means uh, ecclesia is church, community. The keys, binding and loosing. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Christ does everything within the context of a community. He creates a church. This is why we can never say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Not if you're a Christian. You can't. Because then you have to ask, well, what did Christ do then? And um, is this what he intended? Why did he say finally to Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church? and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Okay, why do that? What was that about then? So his intention, the intention of Christ, 
was to leave something behind. And not just a set of teachings, but to leave even a structure so that his teaching would not get lost. And this loosing and, and so forth, uh, uh, that wasn't something that was supposed to end with the last apostle, with St. John. Well, that would be kind of ridiculous too, wouldn't it? We have to think logically too of some of these things. Why would God give this a forgiveness of sins, but only until St. John, when you die, that's it, it's gone. Well, no, it doesn't make sense. And the apostles knew that, and that's why they would do what's called laying on of hands, ordination, the apostles all ordained after them other bishops, after them other bishops, after them other bishops. And if you still go to the encyclopedia and you look up papacy or something, you'll see, where does it start? It's an amazing thing still that encyclopedias do this. They start with Peter. And then they go through every single pope until today, demonstrating that historically we have a way of proving that it has been an unbroken line. Sometimes it's got mixed up when you had three popes at the same time trying to figure out which one was the right one. But one of them was the right one. Right? And, uh, and so now here we are at Pope Francis, and they keep saying, who's it? Uh, St. Malachi, who said that this is the last one. Well, I don't know. And we don't know if that really goes to St. Malachi or not, but they, you know, this is a myth that grows up over the centuries about some of these things. And you have to be careful uh, with these kind of uh, legends and myths and saying so-and-so said this, and oh, maybe and maybe not. The media often gets these things very wrong. And that's because a lot of media, when they're writing, they're not Catholic. And they're not, some, most of the time, they're not believers in anything. And so they're writing on something that they cannot understand, let alone the nuances. And there's a lot of nuances to uh, religion and to Catholicism, right? Like infallibility of the Pope, which is very, very rare. The last time it was used was 1950. It was used a lot in the early centuries. We didn't call it that, but that's what it was when they're hammering out, who is Jesus Christ? 100% God, 100% man. That's infallibility. That's not in the Bible, <laughs> right? The word Trinity is not in the Bible. So there, there is a place where um, the, uh, the councils meet, councils of bishops, and they begin to move along the teaching of the church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So um, we can, of course, pull to the God-man. Jesus certainly says he is God. There's no, no doubt about it. You can only accuse him of being either crazy or God because he's very clear that he is God. At the same time, he is, we believe, the fullness of manhood. He is perfect man. So you can put it together. See, that's what I mean. But as far as um, really laying out the teaching the way the church has, you're not going to find that kind of clarity in the scriptures. Um, and that shouldn't bother you. It's just it's the way we develop the church has developed over the centuries, and she continues to develop. And the way we celebrate Mass now is not the way we celebrated Mass 50 years ago or 300 years ago. It changes. But the essentials remain the same, and that's the key. Whatever is essential remains the same. It cannot change. If an essential changes, we cease to be the Catholic Church. Okay. Is that okay? Everybody get that? Because I want you to be very clear about that. Okay. Well, we're about two minutes before eight, so how about if we take a little break until um, just 8.10, okay? 10 minutes, okay.